Our next speaker, um, you may know. Uh, I first became a member of Borderland Sciences Research Foundation in 1976. And uh, I got involved in, uh, uh, with uh, radionics and uh, biocircuits and a whole lot of other things. And uh, when I moved to Santa Barbara in 1982, um, I had visited Riley a number of times, and uh, when I launched my project to start building uh, magnetic pulse generators, I decided that what I really wanted to do was try and market these things through Borderland. So I called up Riley, and this other strange voice answers the phone and um, says, he's Tom Brown. And I said, well, where's R where I'm trying to find Riley. Well, Riley's gone. <laughs> and uh, that, that was the beginning of a, a long and wonderful friendship. And uh, in those early days, kind of Tom and I lifted ourselves up by our bootstraps because uh, Borderland was really a, a shell of its former self at that point. Riley had bequeathed him basically nothing except the name Borderland Sciences Research Foundation and a very dusty attic. <laughs> And uh, Tom has uh, single-handedly, uh, and with a little bit of uh, advice from me and a, probably a tremendous amount of help from his wife, Allison, has uh, created what I think is one of the uh, premier alternative science uh, organizations in this country. And uh, I'd like to uh, give him a big hand for that. <laughs> Thank you. It was sheer coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, without, uh, I could go on and on. Uh, there's lots of fun stories and, uh, uh, but basically uh, we'd like to thank you all for being here. Uh, Tom and I are looking forward to uh, uh, doing a lot more of of uh, what would we've been doing and uh, so just to give you the the grand view from the borderlands here's Tom to talk about uh, element and ether thank you Peter <laughs> well the theme of this conference is toward a science of the etheric and everybody kind of has a slightly different view of the ether you know what really is the ether I've been into it for, into researching the ether for many years, and what I'm going to try to do tonight is try to go over a lot of the uh, different ideas that I've come across and see if we can't form them into a picture. And what we need everybody to do is use their imagination. Now, usually people think, well, imagination, hey, that guy's got a crazy imagination. But that's what, really not what an imagination is. The imagination is an organ of the soul where like inventions are created and new ideas are hatched. So, if we can get the first slide, please. We're going to take an imagination back into the past. And here we see a plate, and we see on, uh, towards me, we see the geocentric worldview, and on the other side, we see the heliocentric worldview. And this comes from a stage of consciousness when these two views were being worked out. You know, there's a transformation um, you know, after you know, the Copernican Revolution, you know, the heliocentric space became dominant. But if to anybody in agriculture or anybody that really pays attention to what happens outside, the geocentric <coughs> worldview is the most important to our life body. And our life body is the ether. So I want everybody just to close their eyes for a minute or so and just imagine that the Earth is the center of the universe. That the sun does go around, it rises in the east and it sets in the west. That the moon goes around, it does the same, it regulates plant growth. That space is still there, it hasn't left us, we've just denied it because of the scientific worldview that's come about through the heliocentric. Now I don't want anybody to go into the past permanently, it's just a reference to look upon, to spring into the future. In the future, I believe that we should be able to reconcile both of these spaces and understand that it's a synthesis of the two. 
which will bring us forward into new, newer stages of consciousness. There's more than one type of space. We can get to the next slide, please. Um, we'll start out with some ancient conceptions of element and ether. Over on the left here, could you slide over, please, a little, to get the, sen- the, the other direction? There we go. What we see is the tattvas. These were known in like the Hindu cosmology and uh, various spiritual practices as the symbols of the, of the elements. Down at the bottom we see earth, and that was pictured yellow. Water was pictured silver, silver crescent. Air was a blue sphere, and fire was a red triangle. And now, these were more than just symbols that somebody drew down. These actually spiritual and meditative practices where if one, say, meditates on a yellow square, they can open up in their consciousness visions of the element earth and begin to understand the earth process from that, and you can work through that. And then in the middle here, we see what's known as the chakra system, which Carl Merritt went through quite extensively in his talk. And basically, we see earth, water, fire, and air, and then ether, and above we see a throat and the crown chakra, which are above the etheric. And of course, fire is below air, and the purpose being is when the elements come together in the etheric body, the heart is below the lungs. And so that's the reason for the transposition there. And of course, there's colors and sounds. I'm not going to get into this too deeply, because this is a subject in itself. I just want to show how the ancient perceptions went with it. And if we can slide over here. We see here the Tibetan system, where the seven chakras are actually combined into five, where the two bottom ones are earth. Then the navel center, which is over there, fire. It's called here water, up to fire, air, and ether up at the top. This, of course, shows the flow. This is from a book, The Foundations of Tibetan Mysticism by Lama Anna Garika Govinda, which is sort of a schematic um, diagram of the whole Buddhist symbology and how it relates to the functioning human body. So these are just ancient ways to look at it. This this very slightly here and there. Um, there's r- definitive reasons for that, um, but the main thing I want to show is just that the c- concept of element and ether is a very ancient concept. Up at the top here, we have over on the left is the ancient elements, fire, air, water, and earth, again, which we saw on the previous page. And they relate, really, in our modern sense, to the states solid, liquid, gaseous, and plasma. And Rudolf Hauschka's researches, he attributed to the ancient elements, the modern elements of carbon to earth, because carbon is the structure of the earthly life, Oxygen to water, which some people say oxygen to water. Well, oxygen's in air, but where's most of the oxygen on the planet? It's in the oceans. The oceans are only 16% hydrogen. And then next we see for air, nitrogen. And nitrogen sub is one of the inert gases, but it's anything but inert. It's a pulsing gas. It has a rhythm to it, and that rhythm works with our lungs to bring the oxygen in and out to sustain our life. And above for fire, we see hydrogen, and hydrogen is given the attribute of fire because it is the hottest burning gas. So it would relate also to the plasma state. And moving down here, are we getting to what's called the ethers? Can you slide it up, please? This is from Gunther Voxmas' book, The Etheric Formative Forces in Cosmos, Earth, and Man. And there's, again, reasons for all of this, which I'm not going to get into. I would get into the definitions further. I just want to kind of go through an imagination of what all these things were. And um, we see that what's called the warmth ether, its qualities are red and it moves in circular motions. And then we see the light ether, which is yellow, and it moves in, so like a sawtooth or triangular motions. And those two ethers are given the spatial tendencies of being radial, expansive, and centrifugal. And after that, we have the tone ether, also called the sound ether or the chemical ether. And the reason for that being is that 
chemical structure is related to music and sound. It's all one type of activity. And that's generally called blue, bluish and moves in wavy motions. And then the life ether, which is purple and square shaped, and these shapes have shown up in crystallization experiments and in plants with colors that relate. There's very extensive research done on this. And those two ethers are suctional, contractive, and centripetal. We see polarity between the two. And if we slide up to the bottom and get that up, we have what we call supersensible and subsensible forces. What that really means is the ethers are supersensible. It means that they're kind of above our perceptions. We have to you know, build up within ourselves the abilities to, to perceive them. They don't really like strike us like you know, a rock would if it was thrown at us. You really have to understand what the etheric is by looking at different processes. And one good way to look at the process of the ether or to understand what it really is is to look at the plant. Now, you have a plant that starts out as a seed and a sprout shoots up, leaves, and fruits and flowers goes through its various stages of metamorphoses. And you can't really say it, which particular stage is the plant. Well, the plant is the being. It's an etheric being that exists in time. And what we see at these different stages is merely the physical base for it in this plane of reality that we're dealing with. So just to show how these, the ethers here relate to the elements, we have elements across the middle here. Warmth and fire are really kind of like a Janus-headed effect. So the fire element and the warmth ether are really very closely bound up together and can't really be separated. They have to be worked with together. So we have fire, air, water, and earth. And above that then we see relating to air, we see light, which kind of makes sense. To water, we see tone, also called chemical ether, and you know, hence the use of liquids and facilitating chemical reactions. And for earth, we see life. So the densest element contains the finest ether. And this has also been shown in crystallizations by French biochemist Morley Martin when he crystallized azoic rock, which is pre-fossil rock, and was able to get living forms to crystallize out of it after intensive sterilization. And we have what's called the subsensible forces. And what what they're called subsensible for is because they have to work into matter before we can perceive them. And Rudolf Steiner said that electricity was sort of like the degraded form of light. And there's a polarity within light we'll get into, and there's a polarity within electricity we could get into. I could actually spend about two hours just on this one diagram here. And then magnetism is related to tone. I'm not in total agreement with this chart here. This comes from George Unger's book called On Nuclear Energy and the Occult Atom. And he's just merely trying to reference it in his understanding. Um, in the book Man or Matter by Ernst Lairs, he relates magnetism more to warmth and the binding together of things. And then opposing the life energies, we see nuclear. But nuclear is really just the tip of the iceberg of these energies because what we know as nuclear energy is really just the waste heat off of the nuclear reaction. We really haven't learned how to tap the atomic force properly, kind of using the rubbish energies off it and it's killing the life on the planet. And before we go on to the next slide, one final thing about warmth and fire. Warmth and it really binds together things. And one way to understand it is the ethers are always moving up, you could say, and the elements are always moving down. So when you burn something, you're starting a chemical reaction, and the ether goes up, the flame, the heat, it's what, what binds it together, it all disappears, the structure, and you know through spectral analysis, you can see a flame and know what the chemical analysis of it is. And what you have left, you have carbon, the earthly framework for it. And we'll look at some of the polarities here between the element, elements and ethers. Um, the warmth and fire, we have intensive motion. This kind of inside things it's working with. And that kind of relates to time. We say warmth is birth, kind of like a generative energy, where fire is like a dying away. And one way to understand the warmth fire uh, combination in that aspect comes from a book called uh, Synchronicity and Divination The Psychology of Meaningful Chance by Lu Marie Louise von Franz. And she spoke of the Tibetan yak bone oracle, where the Tibetan priests would take like a yak bone, 
that was in the fire and they would take it out and they would study the lines in it and they were able to tell the future. And what she hypothesized in that book was that the bone would naturally age in those lines and the fire sped the process up and by studying it in the meditative state, it triggered off the time sphere in the Lama's head and he was able to look into the future in that manner. Then we see light and air polarities and light is on things, air is in between things you know, light separates. You're in a dark room, light comes on. All of a sudden, everything, you can see the separateness of things. But the air, it connects it all. You know, light releases, it kind of rays out, whereas, you know, air is tension and cohesion. And light is also sucking. You know, light sucks the plant out of the ground. It's not pushed up by any molecular force or anything, but it's actually sucked out and woven by the etheric. But air is oppressing. And also, we can say, that both of those um, are one-dimensional. And to think of one dimension, people say, well, space has three dimensions, but uh, I worked with Eric Dollard for a number of years, a brilliant uh, electrical engineer, and he used to say, but space has only one dimension. He says, it's space. And because uh, if it's not crossing over, so we think of a plant where no branches touch each other, it's just ray out, and it really is one dimension because there are no crossing dimensions on it. And um, then we have tone in water, and of course tone again is called chemical or sound ether. Tone is discrete, you know, tone, we know what a tone is. And you have a lot of tones, you can have a symphony or a song, and they all like keep their own little part and create a picture, whereas water, you know, say raindrops coming down all form into a puddle. So we see the polarity between them. And same with a tree, a tree grows up and outward, whereas a river pulls in. But if you just look at the archetypal pattern of both, it's identical. And a few other things we can go on. I might just move along and not cover everything. Now we see it's two-dimensional, where tone creates nodes. And water has like an inner slippage of planes, which creates vortices. So there's a polarity in there. And then if we can slide up on the bottom here, we have life ether and the earth element. And life is the inner mobility. And you know, an element, that element is rigid. And we have posture and position, so they work together. And that is three-dimensional there, because life and earth work together to form our bodies and to form you know, anything living, organic on the planet. And th that came from, those thoughts came from um, the book, The Four Ethers by Dr. Ernst Marty. Now, that's sort of the ether from the old metaphysical viewpoint and from the modern spiritual scientific viewpoint. But now scientists have tried to find an ether too. We would say the ether of the scientist was basically invented oh, about 300 years ago or so, three, 400 years ago, because the scientists, as the mechanistic consciousness began taking hold of humanity, they, they saw light and they had to think, well, light has to be traveling on something. So they invented the ether. And there was all types of novel experiments developed to try to understand what the ether is, or I'm sorry, to try to measure it. Now we see Fitzhugh's experiment, and what's happening on that is the lines, it, there's light coming out, being reflected, and coming back. And what they would try to do is get two different light beams to come out and react with matter in some way, um, going in different directions, and they would try to get the ether entrained on the matter and see the aberration of the ether through the optical grid work. In this one here, the sideways U-shaped tube in the middle actually has water flowing through it. <coughs> so light passes through the water going one direction and on the other side it's the other direction. So you get the opposing forces there. But unfortunately they didn't find the ether in that one. They found that the experiment, any aberration, was purely related to the refractive index of the liquid being used. And then this is from Dr. Tiwari's papers. Um, which is a, his drawing of the Michelson-Morley experiment, which is probably the best known, which had large stone rotating around with light beams and optical drafts on top, all going different directions. And the stone is supposed to pick up the ether to a certain extent and get the aberration of the light. And over on the left there, we see um, the diagram of the optical framework of Sir Oliver Lodge's ether experiments. And Oliver Lodge was one of the more intensive researchers into this. 
And in his autobiography, Past Years, he writes about the results of all his experiments and his failure to ever detect any ether, although he did quite a bit of hypothesis and wrote the book The Ether of Space, which is a very good look at the scientific view of what they thought the ether was. And he's talking about how relativity came to being because they couldn't measure any ether with these experiments. According to relativity, if you're going nine-tenths the speed of light this way, and you're going nine-tenths the speed of light this way, and you add them together, you're still only going the speed of light. And he says, well, he says, that may explain the experiments. He said, but it sure doesn't make any sense. But nonetheless, that's what we got today. Um, but anyway, these experiments were reviewed by a man named Dayton Miller over about a 30-year period earlier in the century. And what he found was that all these experiments were done in heavy buildings with metal shielding, and he reproduced the experiments up on mountaintops and flimsy buildings, and he began measuring the ether. And uh, we have republished that book on his ether experiments, showing that there actually has been a scientifically measured ether. <coughs> so it was reflected by metals, and all these things were encased in metals. So nothing happened. Now what's interesting about the properties that Dayton Miller discovered was they're quite similar to properties discovered by Dr. Wilhelm Reich in his research in the way called orgon energy. Now orgone energy is basically the living energy of the cosmos, the primordial mass-free energy streaming to Earth. And Dr. Wilhelm Reich's work, which should be investigated by anybody interested in this, will show that this energy is definitely there. It's been experimentally, you know, clinically proven, used in medicine and in psychology and in all types of number of experiments. And what we see at the bottom here is a basic experiment of two orgone accumulators. Now, orgone accumulator is made out of layers of organic and inorganic materials, or what we can say absorbing and reflecting. So the organic material absorbs the etheric, but the metal reflects it as Dayton Miller found in his ether drift experiments. So Reich found by making layers of organic, inorganic, organic, inorganic, so you have basically organic on the outside and metallic on the inside, you know, he may have two to 30 layers even further, that you get accumulations of this energy inside. Now this energy could be detected optically and thermically, and this is a representation of an experiment showing that if you make two boxes, one of them being an accumulator and the other one being a control box without metals or anything but duplicated as close as possible to show that it has the same thermic principles as far as standard physics would go. There's always a temperature rise of approximately one degree centigrade or so in the orgone accumulator. So looking at that experiment, Trevor Constable equated the chemical ether with the orgone energy because out of the orgone energy, they say the ethers evolve out of each other. Out of warmth came light, out of light came you know, the chemical ether. So when you squeeze the ether, compress it into this box, what comes out is the two lower ethers, which are the warmth and the light. And this was all recorded by Wilhelm Reich. So the ether has actually been measured and verified from that point of view. And I forgot to mention, and earlier when I showed the tattvas, there was a fifth tattva called ether, and it was a black egg. It was also <clears throat> and here we see uh, Edwin Babbitt's ether atom from oh, about 1878. This was published in his Principles of Light and Color. And here we kind of see the black egg of old kind of coming into the etheric conceptions of the scientific world in the late 1800s. And there's been quite a number of books on ether physics. Um, Borderland published a lot of articles and books of Carl Frederick Kraft in the 1950s, and we've reissued them for people interested in ether physics. And also Paramahamsa Tiwari, who we're publishing on now in the journal, has developed what he calls a space vortex theory of the ether, and he's working with that. So there's still people working with the ether, although it is outside of mainstream science. Can we get that sideways, please? And we flipped over, away. And it's upside down. There we go, it's okay. Had these going all different directions. Um, 
Now, what we have to do to really get, I'm going to get into some experiments, but to really understand them, we have to get a couple concepts in our minds. And one of them is light. Like most people think, we probably not here, a lot of people don't, but in this regular world, people say, well, what's color? Well, color comes from light. Newton did this great experiment. He isolated himself in a room, shut himself off from nature, put a tiny little slit of light in through a prism, and henceforth he got the spectrum. What happens if you widen the slit up, the spectrum disappears and you get two polarities of basically red, yellow, blue, violet. Now there's just some really incredible theories explaining why this is white, about how rays fall on top of each other and all this. It's kind of fun reading if you've got nothing else to do. But basically, what, what the eye sees, it's like geocentric and heliocentric space. What do you really see? What are you dealing with? And um, so this is the basic experiment of Newton. But Newton only did half the experiment, and uh, Goethe did the following experiment, which shows that there, Newton only did one polarity. And what he did is rather than running light through a slit, he ran light around an object. And henceforth, he projected a secondary spectrum. And of course, when you get magenta in the middle, and when you open it up, of course, you get darkness in the middle. So you could say this is kind of like the dark spectrum, or I call it the etheric spectrum. Now, there's a lot of questions as to whether you can measure magenta in nanometers or whatever else they measure light in. Um, I, I don't believe there's a definitive answer yet on this. It's really an open field for research. But these pictures here come from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology's reprint of Goethe's Theory of Colors. And right on the back cover, they say, well, this stuff's all been disproved, but we just published it for historical purposes. But if you read through it, you start really finding that, you know, the stuff appeals to the, in, the direct intelligence. And you can see, and I've done these experiments for years with prisms. I was quite amazed when I first did it. And it really opened up a whole new uh, area in my mind when I started seeing that light was really a circle that moves around and amorphoses. And you can see all these colors in working through plants, and what have you. So we'd say green is kind of the dominant color controlling the body, as far as like in light therapy, color therapy. And magenta controls like the, the etheric flows, the heart and sexual flows and circulation and all that. So we need that concept. And now we'll go on to the next concept, which is one of projective geometry. And we'll have to use our imagination a bit again here. Can we get that facing up maybe? Either way, or the other way. Yes, there we go. Thank you. Now let's imagine that you're a point. And you start expanding outwards into a circle. And you can think with your arms. And the circle's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And just keep expanding that circle and expanding, expanding, expand that circle to infinity. You've got a straight line. So what really a straight line is, is a section of a sphere or a circle at infinity. So we say a sphere extended to infinity is a plane. So the etheric forces are called planar forces because they work from the periphery. We can see the stages of this projection out. So we have, we say the element works from the point, the center, and the ether works from the periphery. And this is a way, you know, from the Euclidean point of view, you really can't deal with space, you know, just an infinity that goes on out forever. If you really begin to understand projective geometry, you can start understanding the cosmos as an organism and how everything really is tied together. So a line going off in this direction to infinity comes back from this direction. And projective geometry is really necessary to understand the geometry of plants. It can't really be described through Euclidean geometry. Next slide, please. Carry on a little further with projective geometry. Up at the top, we see a cube. Normally, a cube is thought of as coordinates, x, y, z coordinates from the center. But here we see a cube projected from five points on a plane. We see the edge of the plane off at infinity, and part of it's beneath. But there's projection. This is pretty standard. This is in regular dictionaries and regular mathematics books. It's just it's not really understood in the manner that we're looking at it. If we move up a, a bit here, and we'll introduce here a concept called space and counter space. On the left, we see a plane woven of lines and points. And on the right, we see a point woven of lines and planes. 
And, you know, science today looks into the molecular. They don't look out to the cosmos whatsoever unless they're just looking through their telescopes trying to discover a new comet and put their name on it or something. But they're trying to work into what they call a quantum world, a submolecular world, and they do it by smashing electrical particles together that they created in the experiment. These things don't exist in nature, you know, there's no real rationale for it. It's just kind of the way that they've gone towards it. But I believe if people are really interested in the molecular level, if they look at it as a polarity of the planar, and understand that nature moves in stages, so also will the inner forces move in stages, and that's really all quantum physics is. It's just they just don't explain it very clearly, I don't think. And what we get is we get the interplay between these two forces. We can move up here a bit. You see the plant world. The plant like spirals out of the ground. It comes out of its point of the seed working towards the plane, and we get the spiral shapes. And also how the leaves and shapes all plants are woven from the periphery. But they're also modified. We can move on, please. For, by, the, uh, outer fo by the plantary forces. And up at the top here, we see winding shoot of a hedge bindweed. And we see this, the actual shape of this flower is based on the, the rhythm between the sun and mercury. And if we can move on up. This comes from a book called Plantary Influences Upon Plants. And if you like these pictures, there's quite a bit, a few more of them in that book. And then we see dandelion and what's called the umbella ferrae, both which are working with the orbits of relationship of the orbits of Mars and Jupiter to the Sun. And looking at it from this point of view, you can start seeing that the actual shapes of plants are woven by the motions of the, of the planets. And of course, plant, planet, very similar words, there must be a reason for all that. But the whole weaving of life is all based on these cosmic energies coming in and being modified, as we've seen some of these ideas already, both in Allison's talk and in Carl Merritt's talk. So we know that these influences are coming in, but how strongly are they coming in? Rudolf Hoschka did a series of real brilliant experiments based on the work of a man named Baron von Herzla, who found that by growing seeds in a closed container, they would gain weight you know, without any outside you know, influences coming in. Distilled water sealed off and the seed would gain weight. Now, Hauschka heard about these experiments and decided to reproduce them. Herzl's were back about 1878, I believe. And uh, if anybody does have any copies of his works, I'd like to get them. I've just read references to them in Secret Life of Plants and in Rudolf Hauschka's book, The Nature of Substance. What Hauschka found was that the weight change of seeds followed the lunar pattern. We see the peak right after the lunar pattern. This is back in 1934. But during the, full moon, during the new moon, matter disappeared and we're looking at approximately half a percent gain or loss during this. So it's not a great amount but it's definitely there and he used really high quality analytical scales, very precise scientists. Maybe if we could flip this next page here and uh, same, yeah there we go. Um, so here we see the first chart up at the top and this was through the year of 1934. He did these experiments for years with all numbers of plants. Um, so you can see the basic pattern going through. New moon, new moon is the loss, full moon is the gain. But here around oh, the uh, solstice, summer solstice, we see kind of the activity kind of drops out and reverses at this point and begins to come back in so we can see a rhythm going through that. Now he carried on these experiments for another about seven years and he said he's going to publish further analysis of it, which I've never seen the further analysis. But here we can see the maximum minima curves going along and how it reverses around the summertime, slightly modifying from year to year. And basically, what he really showed was that there is a flow of matter coming and going constantly with the lunar rhythm in the plant world. So these forces definitely act within the plant. And these are, you say the etheric forces kind of come from the plane, and the formative forces are the motions of the planets. Now, this led him into another series of experiments. 
you know, with the uh, synthesis of urea, the old vitalistic viewpoint kind of came to a close, if you will, if we can synthesize organic molecules, you know, there must not really be any vitality. But they found if they fed synthetic compounds, say, to cattle or something, they wouldn't grow as healthy as if something was fed something natural. So they figured that there was something that they hadn't analyzed yet that must be called a vitamin. It must be some kind of complex chemical structure that they just hadn't discovered. So the search was on for the so-called vitamins. And there was quite a bit of contention as to what the vitamins actually were. Uh, people came up with different chemical structures, and really what the different chemical structures were, were, you could say, organic compounds that carried the vitamin act action with them, although they weren't the vitamin action themselves. So the kind of resultant, or the overall view of his experiments, for vitamin A, this is early experiments before they had a lot of the other vitamins, although he, he said the others were harmonics of these. A, B, C, and D, which were just labels from uh, diseases that came about from people that lacked certain things in their uh, nutrition. So vitamin A, he gave the essence of warmth. This is carried by oils, and oils we could describe as carbon shells closed with hydrogen, so hydrogen being warmth. And the a vitaminosis or vitamin, the disease caused by lack of the, that vitamin is stunting. And B, he gave the essence of order, which we could also think of as the tone again. And that was carried by the hulls or peels on the periphery of, say, the fruit. And if that was lacking, we got berry berry. We'll get into this a little more. It's just the basis so we can understand. Uh, for C, vitamin C, he gave light, and that's because leafy vegetables, you know, a lot of it in spinach and lettuce. And of course, and we see it in citrus fruit too, which are very sun-like, but they also carry other vitamins. And if that was lacking, we get scurvy. And vitamin D was form, and that's carried by like the lipoids and cholesterol. And from there we get rickets, a bone disease. We slide up a bit, and this is why I wanted to introduce the color and the projective geometry conceptions. Now what he wanted to do is he wanted to find out, well, let's see, if these are what the vitamins are, how can I really tell? How can I shield these out of the growing plant or growing organism? <coughs> so what he did is he created these double-walled and triple-walled vessels where he could grow. He, he picked yeast because it was very life-active and he could do the experiments quickly and do quite a number of them. So he grew yeast inside of these glass spheres and he would have one or two other layers around it that he could insert things into. So he would shield the different parts of the spectrum with different solutions. So he would shield out the warmth, which is the infrared, by using alum solution. The visible spectrum related to the light ether, he, used by, he shielded by using iodine, and Hoshka called iodine the light thief, because the starches which are formed by the light turn black when iodine is put on them. And the ultraviolet, uh, which enhances chemical action, is he attributed to the chemical ether. And he used asculin, which I believe he defined as a glucosite from hazelnut shells. But how could he shield out the life ether? He was trying to think, because it really wasn't in the spectrum. So he says, well, the, the electromagnetic spectrum extends to infinity. And now we know what happens to a line extended to infinity. It's part of a sphere or part of a circle. At the back of the circle, in Goethe's color of the circle, we see green at the one end, and on the back we see peach blossom. So he's thinking, well, what's between us and the periphery? So it was a vacuum. So he shielded out the life ether with a vacuum. Which, when I read that, gave me some pretty incredible insights into various things. So these are kind of drawings taken after the microscopic slides he did of the yeast. And there's the normal yeast for control. And if we move up as we go on, please. And for A is warmth. And also the reason for the double walled is he would shield out the, that section of the spectrum or that etheric energy and see what was happening with it. And then inside on the second wall, he would put in what he considered to be the carrier of that vitamin to see its effect. And he found that this would counter it. So A is warmth and... Um, Basically, with the alum, you know, in the sphere, he got the stunted growth. But what he did is he put butter in there, kind of oily, 
on the inside and he found that the butter would make the yeast grow normally. But only, you could only use that butter solution so many times and it lost its vitality and became dead. So it wasn't something that was really carried in the chemical structure, or we say it was carried by the chemical structure, it wasn't the chemical structure itself. Then for C, leafy vegetables, um, he used the iodine and he got sort of a scurvy type of reaction with it. And he used spinach in order to, or spinach extract in, on the inside wall. And he found it that uh, canceled out the effect. And what he really, what's really interesting here about um, <clears throat> scurvy, excuse me one second. Scurvy really shows a light imbalance. You know, if we go outside and get suntanned, it's because the outside light is stronger than our inner light. And what happens in scurvy is the inner light gets weak. So people's skin starts getting colored from that. So really the reason we get sunburned isn't so much because the sun is burning or anything like that, the way it's usually thought of, it's because there's an imbalance between the inner and outer light that shows up in the skin, which is the periphery of our organism. Go on to the next two vitamins here. So for B, he attributed chemical order, skins and hulls of fruits, grains. And of course, you know, we have this boundary, the outer periphery defines order, and within the, that boundary, we have what we say the music of the spheres, the structure of the stars, the whole structure of the heavens, and on in, inside, you know, we have, we'd say microcosm, we have the inner order, inner chemistry, inner pattern, and use the asculin, the glucosite, to counter the beriberi effects. Here we can see it breaking up. So the periphery, the inner order is gone and getting kind of just not growing properly there from that standpoint. And he used rice bran extract. The reason he did is because the way beriberi was really found was when Asians who subsisted largely on rice, um, when Europeans got over there and started you know, hulling the rice, uh, they started eating the polished rice and they started developing this symptom. Nobody really knew what it was, but it was a discovery of somebody who fed some chickens polished rice and they got the beriberi symptoms and then they fed them some type of bran and the symptoms disappeared and this led to the understanding of the beriberi came from the, the from lack of the hull energy in what you eat. Of course, in the Western diet, we eat a lot of bread crusts and things like that, which brings that into our system. So the berry berry once and is evident over in the Western world. And also, vitamin B is kind of an ordering force in the body. And if we go up to the last one here, vitamin D, carried like by fish liver oil, like I said, cholesterol and lipoids, and phosphorus and sea salt are carriers, and it's kind of densifying shaping forces. And Hushka related it like salt and bone is kind of like a, uh, salt kind of like an archetype of the formation of bones. Salt forms out of a solution into a crystal structure, just like the bones form out of the solution of the embryo as it forms. They both sort of crystallize out solution, we could say. And this was by shielding out with the vacuum and used a phosphorus extract or solution in the uh, triple walled to counteract that. And rickets is a bone disease, and you can see here distended organism, of course there's no bones in yeast, but we see there's like no nuclei, there's no form, they're kind of fitting together. So what these experiments really did show was that the vitamins are really the vitality streaming into earth. You might be able to go to the drugstore and buy some kind of chemical compound that has a concentrated vitamin energy in it, but if you really want to get the vitamins, you've got to eat healthy food, because that's what they really are. Vitamins are vitality. Or there may be numerous chemical structures. Now, how could you do some other experiments? Um, in this experiment here, it says the emergence and passing away of phosphorus and potassium during the period from June to December 1939. And this again was in plants that he would grow in sealed containers and I believe he grew them for about 14 <coughs> days. And he would take them and burn them and do a mineral analysis of the ash. And he found 
uh, let's say you know that the phosphorus increased during the uh, new moon. I'm sorry, during the full moon, decreased during the new moon, and the opposite for potassium. There was one point in the year where each one of them would reverse at different times in the year. And through doing these experiments with all number of plants and chemicals, he was able to start attributing certain specific regions of the zodiac or the sky to the action of different minerals like phosphorus, potassium, along those lines. And he admitted that he was, that was just the very beginning of a new science that he hoped other people would carry on. He just showed the basis of it. So we can see through all that that there's definitely this action of the cosmos in the plant world. So we're really not that connected from, disconnected from it. Although I have heard lately a friend of mine who's worked on a number of biodynamic farms um, told me about a month ago that he was speaking with a couple of the farmers. And they usually plant by this calendar that's based on the flow of the cosmic rhythms. And he said that over the last year or two, a lot of them have noticed that the cosmic rhythms are really no longer in tune with the earth. There's been some type of disconnection there. So, so that's as far as the, uh, out the what we say, the uh, minerals go. And Rudolf Steiner likened the minerals to the consonants of the alphabet and the metals to the vowels. And if we go slide over to the left here, we, see, we saw this picture in Allison's talk. And we see the different metals, silver, um, <clears throat> see if I can remember them all. <laughs> Thank you. Silver, copper, mercury, gold, iron, iron tin. tin, and lead as related. But we see silver has the most resonance and luster, and of course lead has the least, and they're all ordered according to their positions heliocentrically as they're given around the, I'm sorry, geocentrically around the Earth. And the angular velocity of the planets is directly related to their conductivity for warmth and electricity. As we can see, like the angular velocity of Saturn is, in, is given in degrees, it's two. And, and lead is conductivity for warmth is eight and electricity 10. And the only odd one in this bunch is mercury, but he worked with a form of solid mercury, which he didn't say exactly how it was solidified. And then it fit into the chart. So this shows that in, we see the relationship of the planets to the metals. So basically all earthly substance that we're dealing with, both the nutrition and the metals and everything around us is all really streaming in from outer space. So the earth really isn't like something that's left over from the Big Bang, you know, where everything, just some dead nothingness exploded and all of a sudden we had these lumps of hot rock floating around. Um, basically, matter is the resultant of life. So the earth right now is kind of more dead than it was in the past. Earth was much, had much more of a life and vitality about it and it's gone through its various stages. That vitality kind of left its field and started condensing into what we could say humans and animals and basically what we have on the planet today. We're still going through that stage. So we're no different from the surface of the planet. We're made out of the surface of the planet and, and interaction with the streams from outer space. <clears throat> and also the plants in the old days we got all types of substances from the plants you know, we got you know, sugars oil you know, dyes basically everything came from the plant world originally other than of course the metals but a lot of things we used from the organic world and as the industrial revolution went on with the synthesis of organic compounds, we came into what we could say is a mirror realm of the organic, which is coal tar chemistry. We have our saccharides, you know, the coal tar dyes, which Rudolf Hauschka was an expert in dyes and color. That was his main field. I guess he just got into all these plant experiments as a sideline. So, so we have synthetic perfumes, and we see that. So in our world today, it's like this whole synthetic impulse is like working into our civilization here. Now in homeopathy, homeopathy can best be understood, I think, by looking at the peripheral forces and going back to projective geometry. In homeopathy, a substance is taken and it's diluted. Let's say we put a drop of uh, any type of, of some type of mineral or something in water or herb, herbal extract. And it's taken and it's, it's succussed or it's shaken or pounded. 
a certain rhythm. And then a drop of that is taken into the next solution. And it's carried on. We can't really call it dilutions. We call it potentizations because if you just dilute it, you don't get the effects. It has to have that rhythm, rhythm to it. And also it was discovered that different plants, depending on their structures, had different rhythms, like mistletoe has a two rhythm. So rather than using the standard 10 rhythm, medicaments using mistletoe are much more potent using the two rhythm. So what uh, Hauschka found was at different stages of potentization, really Kalisco also did experiments along this line and a number of other people did too. They found certain dilutions had strength and they developed what they call potency curves for all these different substances. We could say these are really kind of like the cosmic wavelengths. So you start out with the matter, the central part, and the rhythmic dilutions, what you do, you leave the matter there and you start expanding out and you circle. And at different stages, as you get towards the periphery, there's different strengths, depending on, we could say, the angle from the central point. And here we see benzoic acid from benzoic resin in the center. The top is distilled water, which was taken and potentized in the same manner. Benzoic acid has a quite lively curve. Um, now, of course, there's, once you go past about the 23rd dilution in homeopathy, you're beyond the theoretical number for any molecular substance to be in there. Uh, I think it's 6 point something times 10 to the 23rd Avogadro's number, to which there's no longer any matter. But you really start getting the best effects beyond that up to even 64th decimal potency, you get really profound effects of substances, which is far removed from the elemental stage. On the bomb, he took synthetic benzoic acid made from coal tar, or from that realm of chemistry. And we see activity, kind of negative activity on, I believe he did this on plants. I forget exactly what effect he had tested this on, a specific experiment. But while there was still molecular substance in the potentizations, he got effects from the synthetic benzoic acid. But after that, there was basically nothing. There's like no vitality in the synthetic. And we can think again about the pictures we saw of Lily Kalisco's in Allison's talk, where she showed that honey, when crystallized with the different metallic solutions, created these beautiful pictures and structures. But when saccharin was crystallized with it, it was dead. There was nothing there. And we can see it. this coal tar chemistry is dead. You know, think about that when you wear polyester, because, as opposed to organic things. Because you know, those are the energies that you're dealing with. It's not that these things are bad or anything, it's just we have to understand what they are and use them in the proper way. We don't really want to delve further into matter. I think science has delved deep enough into matter and split the atom and puts off bad energies. I think we have to start working our way back out towards the cosmic energies again. Of course, one good way to understand how the etheric energies flow on Earth is really just to go outside and watch what's happening in the world. And here we see a plate showing the different types of clouds. Because the clouds, we could say, are kind of like a plasma bulb, like we have the plasma bulb out front. You pump, pump electricity into a gas sphere and you get different effects. I worked with Eric Dolly with a number of plasma bulbs where we were actually, actually able to get cloud formations and star streams and quite a number of organic types of forms to appear in plasmas rather than regular what we see outside there, which is pretty standard, just a uh, high frequency bulb. So what the clouds really are is the interaction of these cosmic forces streaming in, the terrestrial forces streaming out, and the interaction so we can actually see what's really happening in the cosmos by understanding the clouds. At the bottom we have the stratus clouds, kind of move in layers. Now we have the cumulus clouds, which are kind of accumulated, piled up, and puffy. At the top we have the cirrus clouds, which are kind of feathery. And of course there's a number of modifications of these. Um, they can all work together and form the nimbus or the rain cloud. And of those four basic types, um, modern meteorology has defined quite a number, but they've really lost the basic essence of four that it all developed out of from the researches of Luke Howard about 300 years ago. Luke Howard gave these names to the clouds from the Latin. So as we can see, 
the etheric forces are really something, it's our whole vital life, our whole civilization. And you know, that's what we really have to work for. You know, we can continue to look at the molecular theories. They're very important. You know, they're part of what's happening. They're the opposite polarity to the etheric forces. But through all this, we have to work towards a new science because we see if we go strictly towards the molecular, strictly towards the synthetic chemistries, what we're going to have is a dead earth. So with that, I'd like to end it, and thank you for paying attention. Yes, Kerry. Yeah, when you say etheric forces, do you mean the vital forces, the life force, energy, or is it a component of? No, it is the energy itself. It is the life force. Okay. In fact, to think of it as an energy is still kind of thinking of it in a materialistic point of view. What we can say is, you know, the, the ancient intelligences looked at things in a much different manner. You know, when they went out and looked at the natural world, they didn't just see a tree there. They saw the cosmic being, the cosmic intelligence that formed that tree as part of a whole. So we see as the resultant of life on Earth is really the process of these dynamic cosmic intelligences, which some people may think of as gods or whatever, and a lot of different ways to look at it. So they, they are energies, they're energies within them, but it's much more than that. And it really takes a lot of intensive thought to really think it out. The ether is not something you can just measure. You can measure effects like of the orgone accumulator, and we can say that gets close to what the scientists were looking for with the, the hydromechanical ether that they were looking, that they were trying to discover. But the, the ether itself is really, it's the cosmic forces. It's the furthest periphery of space where everything streams in from, the life comes from. Any other questions? Everybody took that right in. Great. <laughs> Yes. What was it? I, I just wanted to know the name of that um, scientist who was doing the research on the polarity of light at MIT, or the MIT published that book. What was it? Oh, it was uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who was a contemporary of Newton. And actually, quite a battle raged in those days over color theory. And Newton won out because he had the connections in the universities and what have you. And also, his model fit the materialistic viewpoint that was you know, forming into humanity at that time. But Goethe, we could say, was the poetic, and the poetic has been really pushed out. You know, there's no poetry in science anymore. And uh, so we could, there was actually a split at that time in human consciousness where the prose and the poetry used to work together. And we could say Newton took the prose and through him developed the whole of modern science. You know, he discovered gravity, saw something fall, but he never really thought yeah, it's easy to have something fall, an apple off a tree, but to explain how that apple rose up and got there, how the structure was in the first place, that was completely lacking from science, and really still is. So Goethe's work was republished in the history of science um, by MIT, but they tried to denigrate it right on the cover, which I thought was really kind of funny, because I think they tried to prejudice you, because in case you might read it before you read their warning, you might actually believe it, because you know, it makes sense. <laughs> Right, that book's called The Rediscovery of Color. It's published by the Anthroposophic Press. It comes with a series of cards in black and white squares and colors and what have you in a prism. So you can do all these experiments. I mean, it's, it, you don't need any type of real fancy, you know, photo spectrometers or anything. It's something you can just do it in your house with a prism. So I think the investigation of Goethe's color theory is one very good way to begin to understand the etheric energies because you can really start to see that there is things outside of the electromagnetic spectrum. In fact, the whole of the etheric forces really is outside the etheric spectrum. It may impinge and react in certain areas of it, like in the visible spectrum, but that we can say is sort of like the signature of the ether. Anything that we really perceive really isn't the ether itself. We can only understand the ether through our imagination, like understanding that the plant or even a human is a temporal being 
and it's not the actual substance that we see before us because we can only see it at one stage. Any further questions? Uh, I, I didn't hear you mention uh, alchemy. I'm wondering if some of the people you were talking about were alchemists or where the whole thing of alchemy might fit into all this. Well, basically, I think what alchemy really is is, you know, there's kind of the debased image of alchemy is just being like the search for gold, which is really a very incorrect image. I think Allison's talk may have covered a little more towards the alchemical conceptions. But basically, alchemy is the working and study of nature. It's kind of like what you could say, science with spirit. So when the alchemists work with metals, metal casting and what have you, they did it knowing that these metals were signatures of the planets. Like Lily Calisco showed that when the sun is eclipsed, gold won't crystallize properly. Now there's no rationale for this in modern science, but yet it happened. You know, the record, the indelible scientific record exists for anybody with an open mind that would like to look at it. So I think that's really what would define alchemy is the ability to really understand the cosmic connections and use the reverence. Like they always had a holy book in the Middle Ages, the alchemist never worked without his Bible open beside him, you know, to have a moral impulse within it. So we're basically out of tape, but I'll take another question or two if anybody has one. Yes? Um, you talked about uh, Rudolf Hauschka. Um, right. Do you have a reference for information regarding... Uh... Yes, he wrote two books that are published by Rudolf Steiner Press in London, both temporarily out of print, but hopefully they'll put it back into print. They're pretty good at that, although they're sometimes slow. And the first book, which most of my talk came out of, is called The Nature of Substance. Um, and the second book is called Nutrition, which is kind of like the sequel. And it would take about a week to give a talk on the entire book. It was just incredible, the whole interweaving of all these things. I really just tried to touch the very basis of it to give everybody an idea of what these forces are and how they interact. So they're very good books. They're really not available right now, but we have our eye on that type of stuff. And this is the type of science that we're really interested in putting out through Borderland. So just stick with us and you'll be seeing a lot.